malaria parasite can sequester and replicate in the placenta. In high risk uh, in transmission settings like Africa, despite these adverse effects on the fetal growth and anemia, malaria is usually associated with only mild or nonspecific symptoms. This is due to the, some of the acquired immunity that the patients acquire, acquire from, over, uh, from chronic uh, exposure. In, a, in Africa, MS effort prevention consists of the mosquito nets and also malaria testing using paracheck tests at each ANC visit. Now, paracheck is an antigen-based rapid diagnostic test for malaria that takes about 20 minutes to read. It's either negative or it's positive. And although the paracheck is more expensive than the uh, gram stain blood smear test for malaria, it provided a rapid result, especially where there is a large caseload of patients to evaluate. At the ANC visits, if the test is negative at the second trimester, then we would use preventive antibiotic medication. And the, the medication we would use was dependent on the area and the type of malaria there. In a wheel, South Sudan, a pregnant patient in her second trimester arrived at the hospital comatose. She had not had any ANC visits. The best history we could obtain was that she had been sick at, the, at home for a week with fever, body aches, and vomiting. Then about three days previous, she had some generalized seizures and had been unconscious for the past two days. When she arrived, she was comatose, non-responsive to stimuli. Her temperature was 101 degrees, respira respirations were 22, pulse was 110, blood pressure was 100 over 60, abdomen was soft, fetal heart tones could not be hard with a Doppler, fundal height was 28 centimeters. She had no neck stiffness she had, and no proteinuria. Her blood glucose was 55 and her hemoglobin was 5. In, in Nigeria, the uh, usual hemoglobin for our pregnant ladies was 6 to 7. In South Sudan, it's a little bit higher, 7 to 8. She, her paracheck was positive. We, start, we diagnosed her with cerebral malaria and started treatment. However, she died 30 minutes after arrival. Two weeks later, another pregnant patient arrived, comatose in her second trimester with no history of ANC visits. Her exam was similar to the previous patient, except her seizures and comatose was only a day prior to her, uh, her arrival at the hospital. Her paracheck was also positive. We immediately started treatment with IV fluids for hydration and glucose. We started her on IV artesanate, and this is the medication we use to treat uh, severe uh, malaria in adults and children. Uh, we we uh, aborted her fetus with the Vasotec vaginally to decrease the uh, placental load of malaria. Transfused her uh, some, uh, some blood, provided supportive care, laying her on her side, paracetamol for the fever, uh, monitoring input and output with, and with a urinary catheter. She remained comatose but had no seizures for six days. On the seventh day, she started to improve. She slowly got well and was able to go home after no apparent residual after two weeks. With, without treatment, cerebral malaria is fatal. With treatment, there is a 20% 20 20 mortality rate. Doctors Without Borders staff carried out over 700,000 antenatal consultations and 131 projects in 2013. We also stress postpartum care, and it does and also also doesn't get the uh, the importance in these countries, especially since 75% uh, of all neonates deaths occur during the first months or weeks. As far as antenatal care, we provide instructions on the mother. Uh, and baby after and before delivery, mother and baby healthy going home, ultrasounds. Uh, we don't have a lot of diagnostic tests, but we do have ultrasounds, and this is provided by uh, uh, one of our staff evaluating a pregnant patient, and again, mother and child. Thirty-five percent of maternal deaths occur during the first week of uh, after delivery. Most of the maternal deaths occur within the first 24 hours after the delivery. The main causes are hemorrhage, eclampsia, and infection, although patients can succumb to infection two to four weeks after delivery. When a woman is delivered by a skilled attendant, not only does the risk of death and hemorrhage and eclampsia uh, decrease, but the risk of infection is reduced by half. Uh, nine months during my time in Nigeria, we did not have a single postpartum death from hemorrhage. And um, I knew, know that it, in the villages that this occurred, because uh, we would hear stories of w women that had died and could not make it to our hospital because they bled. 
postnatal care after the baby and newborn has, has gone home is important, and it is also part of the MSF's uh, uh, prerogative or incentive to take care of. And we try to see the woman and baby twice after the after delivery. The first visit within the first week, if the delivery co uh, occurred at the medical facility. If the mother gave birth at home, we try to send a nurse out to examine the mother and baby within the first 24 hours. However, this is very difficult since most of the time we don't know which mothers deliver at home. The second visit is about four to six weeks to see how the mother and baby is doing, but also mainly to start the baby on vaccinations. In 2013, the MSF provided only 117,000 postnatal consultations. This is about a third as, as many as the as A and C consultations. And that's because the challenge of persuading women to return to care uh, after having the baby is, is, is very difficult. Uh, MSF also provides incentives for them to return. We give them soap, towels, anything to get them to return for follow-up. And the numbers for the postnatal uh, visits has slowly increased over the years with the incentives. When I arrived in Garanya, we were seeing seven to 10 eclamptic patients a week. And during my 30 years of practice, I've treated one eclamptic patient. My first day there, I walked in and within two hours, we had two eclamptic patients came in, come in. And I was going, whoa. Uh, most of these were postpartum patients and with minimal or no ANC visits. Uh, so I had the Nigerian midwives go to the villages and discuss with the elders of the village and the TBAs the importance of ANC visits and encouraged early referrals. Initially, we were delivering about 120 babies a month, and by after five to six months, we were doing about 180. The incidence of eclamptic patients that were postpartum with no ANC visits decreased to about three a week. The visits to our ANC clinics were adding Increase. This, this provided us the, the potential to treat other problems as the anemia, malaria, and infections. Another problem in developing countries is obstetrical fistulas. In developing regions, approximately 50,000 to 100,000 girls and women develop obstetrical fistulas every year. This happens when the, they endure prolonged obstructed labor and cannot access emergency care. Women living with fistulas frequently live as outcasts, rejected by family and community. A husband will turn out his wife. It not only causes the physical problems of the incontinence, but it can result in shame, isolation, depression, and even suicide. <coughs> Excuse me. Doctors' main goal is prevention of obstetrical fistulas by having women obtain more access to emergency care, skilled birth attendants, and proper medical facilities. In 2007, MSF started providing specialized fistula repair surgery. There's a pool of MSF physicians, doctors who are well-trained in fistula repair surgery that come to specific MSF hospitals to perform the surgeries. In Garano, uh, we had, if we had a patient that had obstetrical fistula, we could refer them to a specialized hospital in Sokoto that was run by a group of uh, Swedish foundation that provided obstetrical uh, fistula repair. And they also actually did uh, uh, cleft lip and cleft palate repair. And there are other hosp MSF hospitals in Nigeria that uh, provided the, uh, the uh, repair uh, for fistulas. In South Sudan, what we would do is we would collect the names and how to contact those pa patients that required fistula repair. A specialized uh, team of fistula repair surgeons from Switzerland would come about every four months to perform the surgery on these patients. When we had a patient with a prolonged second stage of labor, eight hours or whatever, and we were concerned about her developing a fistula, whether she had a vaginal or a C-section, we would do preventive care. This consisted of encouraging the patient to drink four to five liters of fluid a day, and we would leave the catheter in for two weeks, 14 days. When she returned to follow up, if there was no fistula, then we would take out the, the uh, catheter. If there was a fistula that was less than four centimeters, we would try conservative care, which would leave in the, the catheter in for another four to six weeks with, with, with evaluation. If the fistula was greater than four centimeters, if the uh, conservative uh, treatment did not uh, uh, work, or if the fistula had been present for three months, uh, then we would schedule her for repair surgery. Post-op care after fistula is very important. And we also, again, had basic instructions of four to six liters of fluid a day, main, having the patient remain mobile, taught her basic exercises, Kegel exercises type, 
left the catheter in place for three months and told her to avoid sex for six to four to six months. We also advised her not to get pregnant for a year and that any further delivery should be by C-section. In 2013, uh, Doctors Without Borders performed 1,032 fistula repair surgery. Uh, this is Yvonne, who I'll show you later, is on the cover of our book. She was 48 years of age, had a fistula for 22 years before she had repair surgery at one of our hospitals. This is counseling a, a fistula patient. This is Yvonne again, very happy after the repair, needless to say. And instructions on exercises to help uh, post-op care going to the surgery. Another area that MSF is involved in is unsafe abortions. There are 20 million unsafe abortions that occur every year, resulting in 70,000 maternal deaths and hundreds of thousands of disabilities. Unsafe abortion is one of the main causes of maternal mortality worldwide, the vast majority, of course, occurring in developing countries. Doctors Without Borders wants to make sure women have access to safe abortions carried out by trained medical staff in order to keep women from suffering and death. And ideally, unwanted pregnancies should be reduced. But in most developing countries, women do not have access to contraception and actually do not have any uh, control over what happens to their bodies. MSF provides family planning as part of the postpartum care. However, in Nigeria and South Sudan, any further contraception had to be provided by the Ministry of Health. And this was very in inconsistent and it's also sometimes non-consistent. MSF does not have a policy on, on abortions. The consequences of unsafe abortion are seen as our medical issue. Is that we do not encourage abortions. The treatment of unsafe abortions related complications are part of all MSF obstetrical projects. The immediate life-threatening complications are profuse bleeding, infection, perforation of the uterus, and other organs. If a woman or girl survives, she can have long-term suffering from chronic pelvic pain and infertility. Despite these risks, women seek abortions for a wide range of reasons. MSF policies that safe abortion is a part of all the reproductive care systems, so we provide surgery in those that have a problem, these problems. Because of the legal restrictions of some of the countries, or most of the developing countries, MSF does not provide abortions at most of their uh, missions. If they do have provided, it is only in, up to the first tri trimester, and it's the medical uh, uh, abortion technique or the manual vacuum extraction. In Haiti, abortion is strictly uh, restricted except for the care or health of the mother, which is never, never uh, granted. This is uh, a 20-year-old woman who arrived at the Port-au-Prince MSF hospital that's suffering from a perforated uterus, excessive bleeding, and loss of fluids from aborted abortion performed by a non-skilled uh, provider. St thanks to prompt surgical treatment, she survived. Many others do not. Another problem is, is in Haiti, Africa, and other developing countries, you can get all kinds of medications without uh, prescription. They're on the counter or corner uh, in the pharmacies or, or what have you. Uh, you can get Cytotec. The problem is, and antibiotics too, but the problem is, that number one, you don't, there's no instructions on how to take it. You don't know how good the medications are because they've been exposed to heat, and most of them are, uh, are, are uh, past their due dates. Young women have very strong difficulty with unwanted pregnancies because if they do have the pregnancy, then they are shunned from their community. Sexual violence is another risk factor as far as women in, in developing countries. There are high risk situations such as conflict zones, refugee camps, and displaced people's camps increase the vulnerability of sexual violence. Women make up 75% of displaced people. Doctors Without Borders treated more than 11,000 victims of sexual violence in 34 countries in 2013. About 95% were women and girls. Only 5% were men and boys. As a medical organization, MSF priorities providing target medical and mental health care that sexual violence victims need. We treat injuries, prevention or treat infections, manage unwanted pregnancy, offer psychological support, and provide medical legal documents. In certain situations, MSF will go beyond these services and advocate for change in the policy by trying to get the countries to change their ways of doing things. This doesn't always work. 
Treating sexual violence is difficult because of the stigma and shame, along with fear of repercussions from many, that many victims have and keeps them from seeking tri uh, treatment. Women who have su suffered sexual violence often come to our hospitals hoping to receive drugs that will keep them, help them sleep or allevi alleviate recurrent headaches, body aches, or anxiety. An MSF counselor, midwife, or, or, or nurse will describe how the shock of the violence can cause these symptoms and how psychosocial counseling can be a service. The concept of counseling is often new to these patients that MSF treats. It is extremely important to create an atmosphere in which the patient feels free to talk, cry, or just be silent. We state that what occurred to her was not her fault, and we know that she is not, did not want this to happen. In Nigeria, we had a woman come to the hospital who had been dragged into the bush, brutally raped, and beaten all over. We treated her wounds, gave her prophylactic medication against pregnancy and HIV, got her to talk to one of our counselors who specialized in sexual violence victims and filled out a medical cert certificate for her to take to the authorities. She was ashamed that this happened to her and was very afraid. She did not return to follow up, although we encouraged her to. When possible, MSF will even send out workers to find patients who have missed follow up appointments and try to persuade them to come back. This works with some, but not all. I do not think this patient ever reported it to the, uh, the police. Shame and, and Hiding and fear is one of the main problems in sexual violence in this country. Counseling is a big part of our pro providing uh, mental health to these patients. And as I said, uh, advocacy, trying to get patients that have suffered sexual violence to talk, uh, talk out. Another large part of our programs in, in maternal health is prevention mother to child transmission of HIV, called PMTCT project. In Africa, about 59% of people with HIV are female. At WHO, World Health Organization, estimates only 64% of the women with HIV in Africa who need the PMTCT uh, services actually receive it. It is estimated that more than 90% of children living with HIV, uh, HIV acquire the virus during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. Without antiretroviral treatment, AR treat, treatment, the mother to child transmission rate of HIV is 20 to 40 percent. The risk of transmission through breastfeeding is about 12 percent. With ART treatment, the risk of HIV transmission to the fetus can be reduced to less than 5 percent. Doctors Without Borders has integrated PMCT treatment in all of its uh, maternity projects. Presently, if not, all the MSF, if not all MSF projects are using what's called the newer Option B Plus plan. This was a recommendation by the WHO in 2013 as the best course of treatment for pregnant patients. It is devised mainly to treat patients with uh, HIV positive uh, pregnancies uh, because of the limited access to the CD4 testing that is uh, in most of the countries. The re this recommendation calls for putting all pregnant women who test positive for HIV on ART treatment right away, regardless of their CD4 t count, and for keeping them on the ART treatment for the rest of their lives. The advantage of the B-plus approach is that it enables women to start ART treatment at high levels, even in, set in, in settings with, excess, with, uh, with poor access to CD4 training. In Nigeria, we, we, ha we had to send the blood uh, of our HIV patients to us lab in Sokoto, and we would not get the results for four to six weeks, so sometimes it was very difficult to treat these patients. The other advantage of the Option B Plus is it can be administrated by nurses, midwives, or other health care personnel at primary care or ANC uh, clinics that are close to their villages or homes, and they don't have to go all the way to the hospital to have this treatment. However, MSF is unable to guarantee lifelong ART treatment in all of its projects. Some national governments require that HIV-positive women be referred to their clinics after completion of postpartum care, although most of the, the uh, countries are very inconsistent of their treatment and occasionally will run out of medication. As I said, these ladies are very happy that they'll come back and they'll have the baby will be checked for HIV, and when that test comes back negative, uh, they are extremely, extremely happy. Also, support groups. We found that with HIV positive uh, women that they get together and have support group and, and, and that this has been very beneficial for, in the projects. Another happy camper. <laughs> 
newborn care. Newborn care also doesn't get the recognition. When I was in Garanyo, Nigeria, I found out that the reproductive system there, or women's health deal, we also did the neonates. So as most of y'all will probably know, as obstetricians, we deliver the baby, we hand it to the pediatrician. When I was there, they delivered the baby, they handed it to me. I was the pediatrician, which was something I hadn't done in 30-something years. But that is very important in uh, developing countries because in 2013, newborn deaths counted for 44% of all child deaths under the age of five. Doctors Without Borders believe a majority of newborn deaths can in fact be prevented without sophisticated equipment or complex protocols. All MSF maternity staff, midwives, nurses are trained to provide basic newborn care and also provide mothers and with information to help to keep their babies warm and alive when they go home. The midwives will assist the uh, baby on at the time of delivery, check breathing, if res basic resuscitatory, resuscitatory uh, procedures needed will start them. They are also trained to check for hypoglycemia, hypothermia, sepsis, and other conditions that might affect the newborn. Prior to leaving the hospital, instructions are provided on breastfeeding and care of the newborn. And also recommend, again, the, the follow-up in four to six weeks for vaccinations. There's limited uh, limitations to what MSF can do. We cannot provide intensive care, medications, or equipment that require very, uh, treatment of very premature infants. But the steps that are provided do make a significant difference in the morbidity and mortality of newborn babies. In Garanya, Nigeria, a young patient arrived at the MSF hospital and delivered a 900-gram baby boy within five minutes, less than two pounds. She had been in labor for several days at home, and when she arrived in the hospital, she was in severe distress, probably due to sepsis from a, related to a perforated intestine secondary to typhoid fever. She died 10 minutes after delivery. The patient's mother had recently stopped breastfeeding her last child and agreed to take care of the newborn. The mother is very, very important uh, uh, patient because if she dies, then there's generally not anybody to take care of that baby or her other babies. So it was very fortunate that, that her mother or the baby's grandmother agreed to take care of this child. He did not have any significant RDS problems was only, and only required nasal O2. The baby was a real fighter. I had to put in his, replace his nasal gastric tube four times within the first 24 hours. If they had duct tape, I probably would have used it. We named the baby Car uh, Carlos. In the initial hours and days after his delivery, the staff provided Carlos with standard care of newborn. We kept him warm, kangaroo care, which I'll talk about in a minute, making sure he was fed every two to three hours with breast milk that was obtained using a breast pump. We also administrated uh, IV fluids and antibiotics. It was not an easy process, and after many ups and downs, baby Carlos eventually started to gain weight and get healthier. After three months, he weighed five pounds and was healthy enough to go home. His grandmother, or mother now, Maria, brought him back at six months of age for a checkup. He was a healthy little baby boy. The doctor who replaced me after I had left uh, Nigeria emailed me uh, after, uh, that the baby and mother had returned in a year, and he was still doing well. It helped our staff know what can be done in an under-resourced country to keep newborns care, uh, uh, newborns alive. This is as infant mortality as opposed to Europe and Africa. You can see the difference. Good old healthy newborns, mother and newborn. This is kangaroo care, where we, the baby is skin to skin with the mother to keep the baby warm. Believe it or not, in the uh, night it can get kind of cool in the desert, so it, uh, small babies can get very hypothermic. Class on newborn care before they go home. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation, but there are also, because tomorrow is the incentive and has a booklet that is uh, uh, by MSF to stress care and, and, and experiences of women in, in developing countries. It is not an ap academic book or a policy book, but it, an attempt to bring together the views and experiences of people who have been in the field and can express both the depth and scope of the, uh, that is needed. And that if you, if you go to the website, and I'll, I'll 
have Karen or Pat some things that you you can you can ask for a, uh, a hardback or printed copy of this book free from MSF, or you can download it. And some of the pictures that I showed you, because all these are of MSF patients, uh, are in the book, and it and it has different accounts by um, uh, nurses, uh, doctors, midwives, but also patients talk about their experience and what they have and how how their lives have changed from from uh, from the care they receive and what. Uh, 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 Conditions that they have to to, to endure. Um, um, questions. <laughs> yes. How did you get involved with Doctors Without Borders? Um, good question. <laughs> um, I, um, well, I felt like as obstetricians, gynecologists, or in, doctors in general that we had an obligation to give back, and I had that uh, opportunity. Uh, after I uh, uh, retired from my practice, I decided I wanted to do something to give back uh, uh, to women's care. And Doctors Without Borders, I decided because, number one, uh, they go where not many people go. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's strictly, um, it is not, it is non-political. Uh, they... Um, uh, don't receive any, any funding from the United States government. Uh, when I was in uh, uh, Garanyo, uh, northern Nigeria, we were the only NGO in that part of Nigeria. And in fact, there's four of us were the only white people in that part of Nigeria. And we were able to, and the people we take care of are great. They are just super. Uh, the, the patients, are, I can't say it enough, and they are, these women are strong. Uh, a lot stronger than I'd be, I think. <laughs> uh, but um, so that and and it it was just I chose, there's a lot of in, uh, of good medical things. There's Partners in Health, Symmetra and Plus, Mercy Ships and whatever. But I like because it, it was it was it was it it, would, it enabled me to go to places where not many other uh, go, and and they're very very well run. No, no, it, it, it depends. I, um, um, Nigeria was a little bit, uh, it was different because that was, we didn't, do, uh, we didn't do surgery there. It, it was, I was trying to set up a surgical thing with the Ministry of Health, but after four months I told, them, I told the MSF people that Nigerian government was going to help. And so I was training midwives and different things. So that, that, it, depends on, it depends on the project and it depends on your specialty. In South Sudan... I was there for eight weeks, and mainly because, uh, like I said, I was the only specialist. I was on working on call 24/7, and we were busy. It was a surgical. That was a surgical uh, 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 operation. Usually, uh, if, if you're the in in that in that um, mission is usually four to six weeks, but I was there eight. Um, and uh, Sierra Leone, one of the uh, MSF hospitals that. Big hospitals that does a lot of surgery, and it can be six months. But there's usually two to three OBGYN there, so you it, it so it depends on the on the on the caseload somewhat, and and their and what their and their needs are. So it can so, so, so some orthopedics, OBGYN, anesthesia can be a lot shorter. Yeah, well, you apply uh, the um, headquarters of MSF uh, at uh, United States is in New York, and and then you, you go through an application process. It, it takes it can take a while, and then they they'll call you and say um, we have um, a, a project in uh, South Sudan for for six weeks, such such a time. Are you can you go? I do. Yes, ma'am. No. So nothing is repaired at time. No. We're not, I mean, it's, it's, they don't have any training, they don't have any supplies. In fact, I'm not sure what the heck they do sometimes. Uh, in Nigeria, um, when the first week or so, they'd say we had a patient come in, she'd been laboring at home, she had four injections. 
And I said, what do you mean four injections? And they said, well, they gave her oxytocin in, uh, injection four times. I said, what? You know, uh, so, and, and they, they, you can get medication. You don't have to have any, I mean, they, from any kind of a, a prescription or whatever. I'm sure the oxytocin they were given I am or whatever was not very, there was no way to refrigerate it. And where they got it, I have the foggiest idea. We would um, see some lacerations and stuff that you wouldn't believe. But no, they don't, they, no. No training, not, or very little training. Um, where I was, the answer is no. Um, there are certain, there, in, in MSF projects, there are certain areas where females, uh, uh, obstetricians, are, are preferred. Uh, but also there's certain uh, missions where you have to speak French. And my French is not quite that good. <laughs> Un petit pas. A anyway, so, but in, in the, uh, in, 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 um, the in, in northern Nigeria where we were, I would say, 99% of our patients were Muslim, and I had no problems whatsoever. South Sudan was a little bit more of a mix. Now, there are areas, and there's also areas just for MSF, and that if you had an American passport, you couldn't go to Pakistan, Afghanistan, I forgot where else, uh, because of you're out there, and, and um, um, they uh, don't want to put the, uh, the uh, mission at risk. But I, I had no problems. But there are some, they'll have, you know, they'll say um, Congo or something like that that would, that would prefer a female officer. But, and I had um, both places, I had uh, expat, besides my the physician, I did have an expat uh, midwife that helped. And the midwives are really, really nice, really good. I don't think so. Um, no, because it's not really a teaching type deal. I, it would be difficult. I, I, if, I, I wouldn't say, I, you'd have to ask the main office in New York, but they, they don't advertise that as far as re re residence stuff. They usually like a couple of years experience and um, you, have to, you have to have a, a, a license to, to, uh, to uh, go. I mean, there's a criteria because you have to make sure you don't, uh, with the country that you're in, you're not violating any of their laws or whatever, and because you're very active. So that could go in other capacities? Possibly, yes, as an officer. Like you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able, you might not be able to do, um, obviously, surgery or whatever. No, I'm at, um, well, you have a, 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 a get, get, how to, how to, mostly the course, <laughs> mostly the course that you go through in New York is <laughs> what happens if you get, try to get kid, kidnapped and search security stuff. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to tell you all the bad stuff, <laughs> but uh, it, it, you know, because doctors out board, when they say no guns, they mean no guns. I mean, you don't have, your security. Your quote unquote security at your compound is a, a, a national staff guy sitting out there saying, please don't come in, <laughs> type thing. Uh, but um, no, uh, <laughs> um, what we do have uh, is they have um, protocols or books. Uh, it's like when I was a resident, and I don't know if it's still the same, uh, Williams. Uh, obstetrics was our Bible, uh, and as I show how, how old I am, uh, our Bible in MSF was uh, the essential obstetrical newborn care book by MSF, and it it, it gives what you know. There's another one, clinical what medica me medications we have available because we don't have the things that y'all have, <laughs> and and what um, what the recommendation for malaria and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So we there is there is a a a, a, a book that we go by or can go by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about transitional care? You live in new position is coming. Are you checking out those patients to do for a What's going on? Person just comes and starts from scratch or 
Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, it, it depends. Um, I was the first obstetrical specialist that they had in Nigeria. And as I say, that was a different thing because I was working with the MO, Ministry of Health doing some stuff and with the nurses and trying to set up some, some outrage stuff. In South Sudan, we have a doctor coming there all the time. Now, the problem with South Sudan was is that um, the airfield that where we, you flew from Juba to Awil, uh, Juba was the capital of South Sudan, to Awil on what's called a WFF, uh, World Food Pro Program plane, which was run by the UN. The landing field was um, gravel, and uh, when it rained, it flooded, so the plane couldn't land. So it was very inconsistent. So part of the, uh, I was there a little bit longer because they kept, the plane kept, couldn't come in. So the, so basically on the tarmac or the gravel, I saw my replacement and said, D -d 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 -d, this is it. But I, you leave a written, I left a written um, summary of, of what was, what happened while I was there and what was going on at that time. And I told him to read it. <laughs> I had about 10 minutes to kind of, so sometimes yes, but sometimes no. That was one of my things I talked with them about, was trying to, it's easier said than done, a two or three day overlap. Um, that was, because I, with, with me being the only one there, that was a little bit different. Now in uh, both uh, uh, Sierra, Sierra Leone, they had more than one OBGYN. There's two, maybe three there. So there's an overlap. So that, that works out better for, for that. So it depends on the, uh, the mission. When I went to South Sudan, actually, the, 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 it happened the same way. The, I met the guy on, uh, he was coming on the, on the plane, I was coming off the plane, and we had about three minutes, and um, luckily I, I knew what to expect. So some, sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> what, I, what I want to stress to residents and stuff is really pay attention to your training. Because that was very, very beneficial. Because the only thing I had was an ultrasound that worked sometimes. Uh, had a fetoscope because sometimes the Doppler didn't work. So your training as far as physical exam, knowing the patient, even if they don't speak your language, talking to the patient, getting history, is very, very beneficial in figuring out what's happening. Because we, you don't, you, when you don't have the fancy stuff, you have to rely on your other training. And believe me, it comes in handy sometimes. Thank you.